Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Messy Metal Podcast slash Docless Fitness YouTube channel. As always, if you find today's information helpful, you love my podcast or my YouTube channel, be sure to hit subscribe wherever you're tuning in from and either rate and review, leave a comment, like all of the things and do it on the other platform too, if you really love it here. Today, I want to talk about something that I think frustrates every single sea level sissy out there, and that is going to altitude. So when it comes to going to altitude to hike, to run, to vacation, to adventure, it can kind of really suck. And I get it. Um, for those of you who are newer here or just tuning in or haven't followed long on my life on Instagram, I just spent basically 13 months living in Colorado, which was my dream. Um, coming from Georgia. And now I am back on the East Coast. And I just went back out to the West Coast to the Sierra Nevada Mountains um, and was at altitude all week long doing all of the things. And so I sympathize with you all. Being adapted to altitude is great. Um, and it's going to be harder if you go there and you live somewhere that's at sea level. But there are things that we can do to help make this easier for ourselves along the way. So um, to start, how does altitude actually impact our exercise and our fitness and training? And what can we then do about that? So a lot of people think that when you're at altitude, um, you essentially like there's less oxygen in the air. That's the idea. And so the, you've seen the historical altitude mass that are kind of like suppressing how much oxygen you're breathing. And so that was supposed to help you adapt or mimic altitude training. And that's not quite how it works. So what happens is that when you're at altitude, the percentage of oxygen in the air isn't necessarily less. But the pressure gradients and the amount is less. So therefore, when we think about like our bloodstream has a oxygen being pushed in and then CO2 pushed out into basically breathing in from the air or out to our body. And we carry that through our blood. And so you bring that oxygen to your muscle tissues to produce energy to drive us forward or keep us going during exercise. And then we leave out CO2 and we come out and it breathes out into the air. This is really live, largely driven by pressure gradients within our bloodstream and inside and outside of it. So essentially, if there's more on the outside, more will go inside. If there's more on the inside, more will go outside. And that kind of keeps us automatically breathing throughout the day and respiration is pretty automatic. When there is a lower pressure gradient at the altitudes that we're at, and the higher you go, the lower it is, essentially less oxygen from that air is being pushed into your bloodstream to be then delivered to your muscle tissues or for you to have enough oxygen to sustain the activity that you're doing. So when this happens, you basically your body has less oxygen to use for either basic metabolic function or exercise function or just existing as a human. This is why your recovery is trash when you go to altitude. Um, your HRV scores might be low. Your heart rate, resting heart rate might be high. Your respiration will increase. You'll see that on your fitness trackers. Um, but it's also why exercise is harder because you just have less oxygen that you're able to use from the air around you. So the only way to truly adapt to this is to live either at altitude or use an oxygen tent or an oxygen or an altitude tent or an altitude type mask while training, which a lot of elite athletes do. And as everyday people are probably not going to do that to acclimatize. So there are some things that you can do though to help improve this. So the thing that you can do while living at sea level or not living at altitude is simply improve your cardiovascular fitness. Now, I know you guys hate when I say this, but when you think about it, having a improved cardiovascular fitness will improve your VO2 max. And if you have a higher VO2 max, that means that you're able to use and deliver more oxygen to your muscles to sustain activity. When you are at altitude, the higher you go, the lower that amount of VO2 that you have to pull from Get. So your VO2 essentially decreases at altitude, right? You have a lower percent of your normal VO2 at altitude. Um, and a fun thing you can do is honestly, like if you look at your fitness watches, like my running watch will tell me what my VO2 estimate is after my workout. And it's pretty variable um, within that. But I notice it will go down like five milliliters per kilogram or whatever, like automatically once I get to altitude, like right off the bat on just like a general run or workout. Um, give or take whatever that actually means to you. So having a higher fitness status and being able to use more oxygen means of that oxygen that you are using when you are at altitude, you know, it won't feel as much, it will still be a decrease, but your overall that you'll have will still be higher and greater, which means you'll be able to do higher, harder intensities, or you're just going to kind of feel better when you're there having a 
elevated cardiorespiratory fitness and being able to just use more oxygen as a whole and extract that and pull it in from your bloodstream, even if there's less, is still going to be a positive adaptation. That's kind of the most important thing that you can do. So if you're planning on going on a trip where you're hiking or running, you know, really actually training for that and even maybe doing a little extra, really, really being prepared for that um, can help you at least feel better during that or be more prepared. I have gone to Colorado from um, the East Coast um, in some of the worst cardio fitness of my life. And I had the worst altitude sickness and like altitude fitness I've ever had in my entire life. And I've gone to Colorado when I was in the middle of training for ultra marathons and felt totally fine. And, you know, everybody has an individual response to altitude sickness and how you feel. And I do get still some symptoms of that. Largely for me, it's like appetite and digestion get really, really wonky for me um, when I'm at altitude, which is perfectly normal. But I can tell a significant and more meaningful difference when I'm in a better physiological cardiovascular shape when I go to altitude than when I am not. And again, individual, you can still get altitude sick and have great cardio fitness, but it should help reduce how hard that altitude impact is on you, or at least feels when you're hiking or trying to enjoy the activity that you're doing. So once you get to altitude, there's a few things that you can do to help reduce this. Now, there's some tricks and strategies for like, if you're going to go to altitude and do something, you should either kind of do it right away or give yourself like three to five days to adapt to a week to do it. But for many of us, we're flying and we're vacationing and we're getting there right away. And we don't necessarily want to wait a week or we don't have a week to wait until we start to feel better to adapt to these things. So true acclimatization takes about 14 to 21 days um, at altitude where you start to st- in you produce more red blood cells essentially those who adapt to altitude produce more red blood cells it's like doping um like that you do illegally um but it's it's your body's doing it you're literally producing more red blood cells to carry more oxygen to deliver to your tissues that's what happens and that's why if you live at altitude and then you go to sea level you know you got zoomies you you got them sea level legs you're it's like all of a sudden your heart rate's like 120 and your pace is a minute faster right because you're able to use more oxygen but that also leaves in about two to three weeks after leaving altitude it isn't a chronic long-term adaptation unfortunately so you're headed to colorado or the rockies or you know bam for alaska or wherever you're at in europe that's way cooler than the places i've been recently um or wherever you are in the world going to altitude And you get there for your vacation, your hike, and you're like, well, what do I do now? Because it's going to feel hard. It's going to feel hard no matter what. You are going to feel that impact of reduced oxygen on you. But here's a few things that I will tell you to do. One, hydrate. Hydrate and add electrolytes. You guys know I love liquid IV. My code is Doclis Fitness. Um, Add in electrolytes and salts. So some of the things that happen physiologically to you when you are at altitude is you will have an increased water turnover. So you might notice that you're urinating more So you're peeing more um, when you're at altitude. And there's some of the impacts that it has in our kidneys and how it off puts that. So even if you aren't hydrating adequately, you can be still urinating more and having more water loss. Um, And with that sodium depletion, things like that, especially if you're at exercising at altitude and there's increased sun and it's the sun can be really, really hot at altitude. You might be sweating more, but then there's a drier heat around you. And so it's evaporating and you don't notice as much. And you're so you're having salt So you're having sweat loss, salt loss, you're having increased water turnover. So hydration is really important. I want you to really think about hydrating the few days you go before you go there, while you are there, adding an electrolyte supplementations to your daily water while you are there, but also especially during exercise. So that 300 to 1000 milligrams per hour, um, general recommendation, just kind of depending on how much you're sweating and how you're feeling and things like that is a really great place to start. Um, This also means maybe watching your alcohol intake. I know people don't like that. You do get intoxicated easier at altitude, but also you can dehydrate yourself on top of this and that might exacerbate any symptoms or make any hikes you're doing feel worse. So, you know, just be cautious of that while you were there. So I know you're like, oh my God, Alyssa, you're telling me to drink more water. That's it. Well, I told you to train before you got there, but now that you're there, I'm telling you to hydrate and uh, salt yourself as you go. Um, this should help a little bit, especially that kind of initial, you know, that first day there, you kind of feel really crappy. Your respiration is going to be really um, elevated. You're not going to feel really good. And so your sleep's going to also be poor. So the next thing that you can really do is just like really focus on your sleep quality and your pre-sleep 
routine. I know on vacation, it's hard to do. Um, for me, I do supplement with beam, which on my code list 15, it gives you a discount for, I can link below. Um, I will do that when I travel more often, especially at altitude, just to allow me to, to sleep a little bit better as much as I can. Um, you can't change the fact that you don't have altitude, you don't have oxygen or as much oxygen. Um, you will still sleep a little more poorly and you might not feel as recovered the next day. Um, but that's, you know, that it's just the name of the game and it should feel better after a few nights of being there. But I do like to take that even when traveling, I like to take my beam, um, supplement. It has melatonin and CDB and some functional mushroom crap. It's the most woo woo thing that I take, but it really works and I like it a lot. And I love it when I'm traveling for these reasons, just to help me get my onset of sleep and also higher sleep quality, which can help you feel more recovered and just feel better in general. I know that poor sleep exacerbates hydration appetite, um, mood, exercise, everything for me and many people as well. And so the next is going to be increasing your carbohydrate intake, whether that's across the day um, while you're at altitude, but especially during exercise. So because your body is using or less capable of using oxygen during exercise or for metabolism, um, especially when you're hiking or you're running out there at altitude, that means you're going to be relying more on carbohydrate metabolism. So you're going to be shifting away from that oxidative metabolism and using a little bit more carbohydrate metabolism. So your heart rate's going to be higher when you're exercising at altitude. That just kind of is what it is. Like you don't need to panic about your zones <laughs> that week. Enjoy yourself. Um, but it's, it's going to be using more carbohydrate and you're going to either feel more bonky or that that low blood sugar hypoglycemic type feeling that you you get where you feel terrible you like want to fight someone on trail you think a squirrel is a bear um you're losing your mind and you know that can help reduce how bad that altitude feels when you're exercising so having a regulated blood glucose level will allow you to feel cognitively and physically better while you're out there but also help alleviate some of that negative impacts that that's having on your exercise and training um, and it can be really hard to eat enough especially on trail when you're out there um, because your digestion can be a little bit off altitude can again reduce oxygen you're going to have potentially reduced digestion which means that you might feel like you're digesting more slowly or more poorly um, but that's also another reason to err towards easier digesting foods, like maybe some carbs rather than fattier foods on trail, which can be harder to digest to begin with, especially when you're then having reduced oxygen, you know, higher exertion and, and make, make, make you kind of have that rock in your gut type feeling. So if you're doing long, slow day stuff, that's totally fine, you know, to have, you know, some trail mix or whatever, a little bit of peanut butter type stuff, but just be weary of how much you're eating, but making sure that you're getting in carbs um, or sugars while you're on trail to help with that as well. The next thing is going to be slowing down. I know that it sucks. You know, you're trying to hike your 14er or you're out at altitude and you know what paces and intensities that you normally can go, but you can, you're not going to be able to do that. And the higher and higher you go, the lower and lower your VO2 or how much oxygen you can use is going. So, you know, if you're, for example, flying into to Denver and you're at five, some whatever between five to six thousand feet and then you drive up to you know the base of a 14er and you're oh you're at nine ten eleven thousand feet and then you go up to that like at each stage of that the oxygen demands are going to be you're going to just have less oxygen to pull from and so the demand in your body is going to be more so i know even going from like you know a mile up denver boulder area up to then like the base of mountains or some of the ski towns or Crested Butte or any of these places that are nine, 10 thousand feet at the base, I can tell a big difference. You, I can feel my respiration increasing at night and those things, even with having some sort of baseline. So if you are coming from sea level, maybe consider spending like your first night, um, in somewhere like a city that's at that, you know, five to 7,000 feet and then going up for the next night. So you can kind of adjust a little bit as you go. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's you just pay attention to signs of altitude sickness while you are out there. I know that it really sucks to have your vacation be planned somewhere where you potentially can feel sick from just the environment that you're in. Um, but taking it slow on your hikes, easing in, taking a lot of water breaks, snack breaks, not pushing and rushing that, you know, starting early to beat the heat and the storms are important, but also starting early so that, you know, you can have enough time to do the thing that you need to do and beat that heat, which can compound some of these impacts that you're having on yourself. Um, but then giving yourself grace and 
being cautious and paying attention to signs of altitude sickness or anything like that, especially if you're planning on doing higher altitude things. Um, there's a reason that, you know, people will do things that adapt over time, um, that allow your bodies to adapt over time, especially at going to very high altitudes. But, you know, be wary if you start to feel dizzy or you start to feel lightheaded or you start to feel like really excruciating headache type pains, anything like that, cardiovascular symptoms, whatever it is, you know, Make sure that you stop and it's okay to turn around or pause or take a break if you need to. If you feel like you need to sleep or take a nap on trail more than your normal fatigue, that also can be a bad sign of just having some sort of altitude sickness. Um, so you just want to be gracious with your body. Um, eat the foods that you can eat. I know weirdly enough when I'm at altitude all I want to eat is salads and like french fries like I just want like salt and water is really all I'm craving during that time and so for me just like finding foods that allow me to meet my needs but I'm also willing to eat um if you're someone who deals with that appetite issue and like you know not giving yourself GI distress but making sure you're still eating to fuel the activity that you're doing and recover from it and prepare for it um and you know giving yourself grace and adjusting and modifying what that might look like compared to your normal life when you are at altitude um and especially honestly I mean, if you're someone who deals with altitude sickness or GI distress or is doing activity at altitude and you're more sensitive to that, I really would suggest reducing the alcohol while you're there, even though it might not be fun. There's a lot of breweries, but it is something to consider. Luckily, there's a lot of non-alcoholic options nowadays because um, that just might make you feel worse on top of all of this. But, you know, give yourself grace, you know be patient with yourself maybe plan your bigger hikes for later like at the very end of that week that you are there um maybe you do a few small things that are earlier in the week and then you do like the really big thing at the very end whether that's distance time or altitude so you can give your body a little bit of time to adapt you can you know sleep hydrate all that stuff rather than getting off the plane and hopping to the highest uh, point that you can get and that's pretty much it it's not really fun or sexy i know people don't like this i know that you know it's not as enjoyable of a hack as you would like, but the best thing that you can do truly is to have as much cardio fitness as you can before you get there, dehydrate, salt, carbohydrate while you're there, try to sleep the best that you can, try to feed yourself well, and take your time, go slow and turn around if you have signs of altitude sickness. So I hope you guys found this helpful. Um, if you are going on a trip, let me know in the comments. You know I'm a mountain girly and through and through, and I'm totally with you. And, you know, even last week I was hiking – Mount Whitney out in California, which is the highest peak in the continuous United States. And I started to feel a little bit of almost what seemed like altitude sickness for the first time in a while. Like even coming from sea level, it's usually I just slow down. I do a lot better than those first few trips that I took um, back in back in the day. And, you know, Regis was my my husband was just like he was like, all right, Alyssa, you need, he's like, drink that water bottle. He had caffeine, had a caffeine packet in it, a water bottle. And I, I knew that if I start to slow down in altitude, I wanted something easy that was sugary. So I had peach, peach rings in my pocket and I bought enough. And I was just like every few steps, once I hit 13,000 feet, I was like peach ring, sip of caffeine, sip of electrolytes, sip of water, keep going, peach ring, caffeine, <laughs> electrolytes, water. And it turns out that I was just kind of a little bit bonky. I was a little needed some water and carbs in me. And as soon as I got up to 14,000 feet, it was like, I mean, I was still not at 100% effort. Um, but physically, I felt absolutely fine, totally fine. I was chatty Kathy at the top with people. And it really came down to the fact that I was undernutritioned more than it was the altitude, but that compounded and exacerbated that. And I felt really, really, really terrible for that small bit of trail. And, you know, I was, once I got to the top, I was like, if I don't feel any better, I feel worse and I'm just not going to summon. I was going to make that call for myself, but it really was a nutrition thing. So don't be afraid to, you know, you know, use my trick, use my hack, pause, get some sugar, carb snacks, food in you, get your electrolytes and water in you. Um, it makes a really big difference and take care of yourself out there. So enjoy your vacation, be smart, you know, get high, <laughs> whatever that means for you. Um, and fuel yourself appropriately while you were out there, because that is going to be the biggest game changer for you. So I'll catch you guys on the next episode. And I hope you have a great next adventure wherever that takes you.